Mohammed to disclose agreement between the federal government and X, formerly known as Twitter. Justin Namdi Okwi Dingba of the Federal High Court in Lagos has ordered former Minister of Information and Culture, Lawyer Mohammed, to disclose the details of the agreement between the federal government and X, formerly known as Twitter, following a suit or freedom of information suit brought by the Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP. The judgment delivered in May 2024 compels the former minister and the Ministry of Information to provide a copy of the agreement to SERAP to assess its compliance with the protection of Nigerians' human rights online and the certified true copy of the judgment was obtained last Friday. Justice Dingba held that disclosing the details of the agreement is in public interest and does not harm Twitter's business interests or Nigeria's sovereignty and national security. The court dismissed objections raised by the minister's counsel and upheld Serap's argument. The ruling follows the Nigerian government's suspension of Twitter operations on June 4, 2021, after it removed its post from former president Mohamed Buhari. The government lifted the suspension on January 13, 2022, stating that Twitter had agreed to comply with Nigerian laws, national culture and history. Now, joining us to discuss this is Kola Wale Oluwadari. He's the Deputy Director, Serap. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. All right. So we're talking about disclosure of the agreement. I mean, you are the Deputy Director of Serap. Can you just let us know what the agreement is about, what the nature of this is about, and why it has gained or attracts legal scrutiny? Thank you very much. Uh, like you said earlier, it's, it was predicated on the ban of Twitter uh, by the federal government. And um, this uh, the subsequent lifting of the ban. And then what the minister had said on behalf of the Nigerian government at that time, that there was an agreement between the Nigerian government and Twitter, which uh, is what made them lift the ban. Of course, we wanted to know the details of that agreement, like every Nigerian has the right to, to do, because the implication of that ban at that time, and even now, and even the judgment is uh, in favor of freedom of expression. And that is why we, got, we went to... We wrote a freedom of information request uh, to the minister at that time, asking for a copy of that agreement and all of, uh, the details of the contents of the agreement, which, of course, he didn't provide at that time. So we had gone to court. And now the court has agreed with Nigeria and by implication, Nigerians, that if that agreement exists, and there are people who have said that the agreement did not exist, then the minister has to provide it to Sarah for us to look at the content. No, don't forget, the implication is that it affects the freedom of expression of millions of Nigerians who use Twitter, if that just to express themselves that they have the right to do, or even use it for business as part of their rights that they have as Nigerian citizens. And that is why this judgment is very important for freedom of expression and then to democracy as, as a system of government that we practice in Nigeria. One, the ban was lifted in 2022, we're in 2024. My question is, how, why did it take so long for Serap to even bring up this kind of conversation? Uh, the Serap had filed a suit uh, after the Freedom of Information request in 2022. We had issued the Freedom of, request, freedom of Information request in 2022 when government lifted the ban. And immediately, uh, Mr. Lai Mohamed had said that there was an argument signed. So the suit, as you would see, it took almost, uh, I think, two years plus before we culminated in this judgment. So the, the this uh, it's coming late, as it were. But even though the conversation is not late, within the context of, of the democracy practice, because it took two years in court. And you would see that uh, the minister... Uh, the mini, uh, lawyers of the Ministry of Justice uh, defended the suit. They tried to make to convince the court that uh, the argument, the disclosing the argument, would be in the make out to Nigeria's democracy, national security, and even that it would affect Twitter as a top party. And I'm happy that the judge saw through that sham of a defense and entered judgment in in favor of Seraph in this instance. And it, you wouldn't. It's very important that we're having this conversation. The reason why having a copy of the argument is important, apart from the uh, the general right to freedom of expression is that the Nigerian government cannot enter an agreement on behalf of Nigerians because the Nigerian government 
represent Nigerians without protecting the right of Nigerians. And we own those rights as rights holders. We have the right to know because if that agreement perhaps uh, uh, says that I cannot use Twitter, I can say this, I can say that, I, I have the right to know, which is why that judgment and even disclosure of that agreement, if it does exist, it, it is very important. Was of transparency and accountability, you know, in governance as a whole. Yes, it's also part. Of, it also has implications for transparency and accountability, and, and, and which is why the, the the argument proposed by the lawyers in court was just it, it didn't stand up to reason. Really, uh, what what could be the danger? in Nigerians having access to this kind of documents. Nigerians, we signed uh, we signed bilateral agreements, trade agreements, and all manner of agreements, and even conventions and treaties, almost, uh, almost on a daily basis all around the world as part of governance and international relations and politics. And Nigerians, these documents are not hidden. If you access them from the various ministries, they would provide a copy in line with the mandate of the freedom of information. So there is really no problem in making this available. It's all part of that transparency and accountability mechanism, which is a very important part of governance. We should say, look, for instance, look at the Samoa agreement making rounds. It's because people had access to it. That's why they can ask questions. And it's not about whether the people are right or wrong in their oppression and their fears. It is that the freedom of expression that we have mandates the government to provide this information to Nigerians. And that is why this judgment, and even providing that argument, if it does exist, I will say again, is still in forgeance of freedom of expression transparency and accountability by those who hold public offices to make them know, uh, as a reminder all the time, that they are answerable to the people, whether they are in or out of the office, insofar as those actions were carried out as part of, of their public service. So talking about freedom of, of expression, I know that something had happened, which is with a former president, and that was the reason why. Do you think that sometimes the government tries to um, cripple our freedom of expression, whereby we cannot just say anything if it contravenes um, what the government is about at the time? Of course, of course. And, and we can situate that contextually for the various administrations that we've seen in Nigeria. We can limit it, for instance, from 1999 till now. There are various things that are taking place under each administration that you would use to measure some sort of index as a freedom of expression. And we, 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 we've been here around since 1999 to see how the various administrations had spared in the way they either enabled or crippled freedom of expression. And freedom of expression being a right, of course, has many facets. Call it uh, the nuances that it applies to everyone. Press freedom is also embedded in freedom of expression. This conversation we're having is also being done within the context of freedom of expression. The government letting Nigerians know what they are doing, how they want to do it, who are the beneficiaries, is also part of the context of freedom of expression. And we've seen the various administrations how they fail, which is why also we are addressing this administration not to toe the line of those that don't so in the past. The Buhari administration was really not uh, did not really score high in terms of freedom of expression because that uh, that um, administration, as part of the many things that it did wrong in breaking the law, also suspending Twitter was very wrong just because Twitter pulled down a tweet by the president. The president is a citizen first and foremost before he became president, and now that he has left office, he's still a citizen, and that is why even as a matter of principle, if someone wants to uh, take away the right of a former President Buhari, for instance, as an example, uh, to freedom of expression, for the principle of freedom of expression, we will still have to defend them. And that is why we must understand that these issues are based on principles, not about persons or, or the office. And the assistant of the Nigerian government since 1999, perhaps, it has escalated from the Obasanjo administration up to the present one, has been, there has been a steady incline, a, a, a rise. In, in various aspects of, of limiting freedom of expression. Like we've seen recently under the Pitinubu administration, uh, the use of the NBC, which was very rife under Buhari, by the way, the use of the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission to uh, to issue ultimatums. And we will find reduced uh, broadcast uh, stations for what they perceive as, uh, as something that offends national security. And the use of the Cyber Crimes Act and even anti-terrorism laws uh, to charge people to court for uh, because people simply express their views online. And that is not right. Part of democracy is people expressing themselves, not only in the ballot every four years, but also on every available medium. And it really, it should be encouraged. And does the president think that everything the people will say about him will be good? Of course, he's going to find some of those offensive. He doesn't make it wrong. It's not. It's not. It's it's just right. Even the the president, and I'm talking about President Tinubu, and the politicians when they are applying their trade by way of campaign, don't say don't they say different things about the other party, political party? Is that not part of freedom of expression? Is that not part of 
of our democratic practice. So, which is why conversations like this should show that in the aspects of governance and politics, freedom of expression as a principle is what should be respected, not the persons, not the political party or who said it and when, when he said it or, 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 or what is meant to protect. I completely agree with you because at the end of the day, criticism is good. And that is how you know um, what the people are saying and what they want better. So if they are not going to speak up, then how do you know what to do and, and how it will impact their lives positively? But I want to ask, so what was the cause, um, you know, how did the court justify this and how did they come about this decision? And what is the federal government's response to all of this right now? Um, Justice Dimba, and I must salute his courage and the, the the legal dexterity and also the intellectual effort that went in this judgment. It's very, it's very, it's very interesting if you look at that judgment, that the court recounted the Serap's um, prayers, the reliefs before the court that our lawyers have filed. The court also looked at the defense filed by the defendant. And I'm happy that the court took time to analyze the defense that they had brought forth to say that uh, the, the agreement, uh, making the agreement available to set up or publishing it would jeopardize Nigeria's national security. And it just saw through that. No, there is no way this agreement would jeopardize Nigeria's national security. This is an agreement between Nigeria and another, and another business entity. What is that? This has nothing to do with, uh, this has to do with the army or any of the intelligence agencies. Not at all. And also, the court also saw through the uh, the defense that it would affect uh, Twitter being a top party. Of course not. It won't. <laughs> if Nigeria has published things that are even much more important than these, as it were. And that's why the court agreed and arrived at that reasoning in law. Of course, upholding the right of Nigerians and Sarah being a Nigerian organization also to freedom of expression, mandating the minister to provide a copy to Serap under the Freedom of Information Act. So that was the rationale behind that judgment, which we applaud sincerely, and we think it, it, it is good for democracy. As to the, the response of the federal government, uh, we are yet to get any kind of feedback from the federal government, even though we forwarded the CDC of the judgment. Of course, uh, their lawyers participated in the, uh, in the proceedings and the hearing of the suit, so uh, they also have notice of the case as well. Uh, we are yet to get any official response. So uh, the stage now is to also continue legal advocacy to ensure, and I don't really think it's only legal advocacy at the stage for the Nigerians to own this as it were, and to ensure that this judgment is implemented by compelling both the former minister in the action to do quality women's office and then the ministry that is exists as a continuum of governance to provide that document. And if it doesn't exist, let them tell Nigerians it doesn't exist. But for, so for Nigerians now, um, stakeholders, civil rights organizations, what has the response, what have been re the reactions, what have they been like, like the media now, what are they saying? Do you think people are responding the way you guys would want them to? Yes, I think the response has been largely positive about people also demand because you know you know the Twitter community, the Nigerian community is very active digitally and in terms of using the media to express themselves. I'm sure uh, millions of people would uh, listen, watch this present conversation either now or on other various social media platforms. So Nigerians are digitally active and aware well, in this instance. So you would understand that that Twitter ban. And the agreement that the minister had said uh, had paved the way to lift the ban is very interesting to Nigerians, even those who are not using Twitter, because they know that if Twitter can be shut down, of course it can affect Facebook, it can affect Instagram, it can even affect WhatsApp, it can affect uh, YouTube, the things you've taken for granted that would not be shut down. We've seen countries shut down the internet, by the way. So I, I think this is why the response has been largely positive, because people understand the context of the lawsuit and the implications. Uh, devoid of the legalist, people know what this means for them. That uh, it means government can wake up one day and just say, we're shutting down Facebook, we're shutting down Twitter. You can't even use WhatsApp because so, 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 XYZ, it contravenes national security. And that is why the response had been uh, largely positive uh, for Nigerians because I think they understand the implications. And conversations like this also will deepen that understanding, make people understand, that, of course, this has nothing to do with politics. This is, not, uh, uh, this is not about religion or who is in power or not. It is simply about transparency and accountability and the human rights of Nigerians uh, to freedom of expression. Having to disclose this agreement, what are some implications um, for this? What do we expect to see? 
um, between the agreement from uh, Twitter or uh, and the federal government? What are the implications to this? And how do you even think it would impact um, maybe other agreements going forward from the federal government, knowing that, well, CERAP or any civil rights organization, can civil, um, civil society organization can just come up and ask them to disclose it? I think it would mean that the Nigerian government would be more responsible in their duties towards the Nigerian people, either in uh, taking rash actions like they did with the shutdown of Twitter, or even in negotiating any kind of agreement uh, with any uh, entity, whether it be the state or even a business entity. I think Nigerians are very aware much more aware now of these issues and will show a keen interest in how those agreements seemingly uh, harmless as they appear might impact on the average uh, Nigerian. Of course, the government is not signing this agreement on behalf of themselves. It's on behalf of the Nigerian people. And I think that implication is, is, is far-reaching and I think Nigerians are also growing in this awareness, which is why conversations like this, your organization uh, giving this platform is very important for people to understand and then come continue the advocacy. The Nigerian government cannot just wake up, sign a treaty or a convention or an agreement without consulting uh, Nigerians as it were. And when I mean consult, it doesn't mean they are going to have a referendum. It simply means the various agencies involved have individuals who are either appointed or elected and who answer to their various constituents. So I think the awareness is high. So uh, one of the implications I think is that people are now more aware and the Nigerian government will perhaps be more circumspect. I, I really do hope they are in future actions and perhaps it would also affect the wrong use of the cyber crimes act uh, to charge people to court for what uh, is perceived as being critical of government so those cyber stalking and cyber bullying laws i think that implication also if we get to that point and i think ultimately people understand that social media platforms as a means of freedom of expression is not evil as some people want to see it. So it's just another platform and means of freedom of expression. And those rights ought to be respected just because someone says something critical or you do not like or you find it offensive. It doesn't make it wrong. In fact, the laws, are international human rights laws have recognized this uh, long since. Uh, I remember the Andes case in 1976 where the courts, had rec the international human rights courts had recognized the right of individuals to be offended by whatever I say or Put. It doesn't mean you have to like anything, like everything I say, but you have the right to be offended. This is also the same way I have the right to express myself, insofar as it's within the context of the law. Okay, so talking about the cyberbullying, you have a right to express yourself. I have a right to be offended. But how am I sure that I am not being bullied? Because you see where people are being bullied and they get in, they go into depression. Some people actually commit suicide. So in the, in, this, in, the, in the space where we need to guide all of this to make sure that people can express themselves freely, but how do we also control what these people are saying as well? So it's both a matter of of the use and the process. And that is why the law has also envisaged this. With the growth of, 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 of the digital space, what has happened in international market mechanisms is that the rights that we have in, in, in the real, the real, the real the life uh, rights that we have has also transcended to the digital space. So before the digital growth, uh, rights to expression will be limited to maybe newspapers, print, radio, and all that, and the, the various rights that we have. But those rights have now transcended online to mean that the right that I have to have a conversation with you in a public place, for instance, or inside a bus, also means I can also say the same thing online. So, And there are laws that guide that already. We have the laws of defamation, for instance. I cannot say something about you that is wrong and then publish it and it causes you a there are laws for that already. There is no need to criminalize it. And that is what we've been saying. You do not need to criminalize it because if I defame you, you have a remedy, which is what I said about process. Your remedy is to go to court. You would have your day in court. You would prove that what I've said is not true. You would prove that you have suffered from it. And then you will get damages as it were, including having me apologize or, or do a retraction. The laws are there already. But what we've seen is this knee-jack reaction to digital spaces where it's it's been criminalized. And it shouldn't be criminal. It's not a criminal wrong. And so when you look at that also goes to the issue of, of, of the process. What is bullying? Who determines what is bullying? And that is why we have the judicial process. And that's why most of the cases that is being filed under the Cyber Crimes Act, it gets dismissed. The one against Agba Jaling was dismissed recently. It just gets dismissed because, again, there will be no merit in it ultimately. So who determines what is bullying? 
Okay, so if we're having a conversation online and then you say something about me, perhaps you insult me and I insult you back. And then perhaps I have uh, 30 followers who join me to insult you. We call it <laughs> bullying. Again, we have to look at the context. And that is why the law is there already. The processes are there in court to follow. But when we criminalize those processes, it introduces an element that makes it harder. Because if it was, a, if it was done through the civil process, if you, the, the laws are clear. To claim defamation, for instance, you would have to prove that I published a statement. You would have to prove that it is not true. You would have to prove that you've suffered some kind of wrong from it, and then you claim damages. But when you criminalize it, it's just as simple as, even if you know I didn't say that, thing, and even if you know it is true, all you have to do is make the police pick me up, lock me up, spend months in prison, but which time I would have been punished in court, because that is what you wanted. And then two or three years down the line during the criminal trial, I'm, I'm found innocent. And that is a trend we've seen going over the years, which shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so finally, what is the timeline? Because now the court has ordered that Lai Mohammed discloses this agreement, but what's the timeline for this and what happens if it doesn't? Um, there are no, the judgment of court should be obeyed immediately. So there are no timelines in terms of ultimatums. If there are going to be any ultimatum, it is from us now engaging the by us, I mean Sarah, engaging the federal government, the minister, and the ministry as a party. We've taken the first step by writing to the ministry, making taking that extra step, uh, sending the CDC of the judgment to them and asking that they comply with the judgment. But if they do not obey the judgment, in, in, including by the day, I mean both the ministry and Mr. Lai Mohammed, because they are legal.